Good afternoon and welcome to today's Ad Week webinar. Are you really measuring the performance of your CTV campaigns? Today's webinar is sponsored by Ground Truth. I'm Danielle Moore, Senior Manager here with Ad Week's Content Studio, and I'll be your host. Before we begin, I do want to take a minute to make sure everyone knows what to expect from today's event and is familiar with our platform and its features. Presentation will go somewhere in the 30 to 35 minute range, after which we're going to have plenty of time for audience Q&A. So if at any point you have a question for one of our panelists today, just use that Q&A tool right beneath the video window on your screen. And we're going to get to as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. Also, it's definitely not too late to invite your colleagues to join us at today's event. Uh, about 15 minutes ago, you should have received a final reminder email from us. And in there, you can find a link to the webinar registration page you can share with your colleagues. Still plenty of time for them to join us live today, but if they can't, today's webinar is being recorded and they can always catch the on-demand version. In fact, that recording will be available to all registrants. We'll send you that link later today when it's live around 3.30 Eastern or so. And as always, if you enjoyed today's webinar, definitely check out the full Adweek webinars calendar at adweek.com slash webinars, which is also linked in the event resources area below. You can see what we have coming up and get access to our archive of on-demand events as well. Uh, and if CTV is a big focus for you right now, you are definitely not alone. You can see we'll have a number of CTV-related events coming up. So if you find today's session helpful, be sure to register for those. Also, plenty of events on a wide variety of topics coming up from influencer marketing to multicultural consumers, contextual targeting, measurement, even Gen Alpha. You name it, we've got something on the schedule. So be sure to check out that calendar. Also in that event resources area, you can find that links to Adweek's resource library and microlearning videos. Now, let me introduce you to today's speakers. We're very happy to be joined by Nico Nieto, CMO at NAFNAF Middle Eastern Grill. Nico leads advertising, loyalty, and promotion programs at NAFNAF, a Chicago-based restaurant chain with more than 35 locations. We're also pleased to be joined by Stephanie Eisenberg, VP of Advanced Video and Agency Partnerships at Horizon Media. Stephanie's been a part of Horizon's Advanced Video and Agency Partnerships team since October 2020. We're also pleased to welcome Kelly McGee, Director of Digital Marketing at Jersey Mike Subs. Kelly works in digital marketing for the Sub Sandwich franchise with more than 2,400 locations nationwide. We're also pleased to welcome Stefan Vandegraaff, Director of Digital Marketing at Chamber Media. Stefan's a co-founder of the Salt Lake City-based agency. And finally, we're pleased to welcome our moderator today, Rosie O'Meara, the CRO of Ground Truth. Rosie leads top line growth across all of Ground Truth solutions with direct oversight of the company's sales team. All right, we've got a lot of great content to jump into today. So without further ado, let me bring all of our panelists up here to get started. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you so much. Shout out to Danielle for making this all so easy and making this happen today. Um, I am so excited to be doing this with this amazing group of thought leaders. Um, this conversation is really going to shed light on how some of the smartest brands and agency teams in the world are thinking about CTV as part of their marketing strategy. Um, and this morning, I think I realized just what good timing this is too. We're about to walk, leap, run into Q4. And it's that time of year when it can feel like our business year is over, right? There's only so much we feel like we can do to move the needle in Q4, only so many more points we can put on the board. But it's also that time of year that I like to remind myself and my teams, we have 25% of the year left. And there's still a lot we can do to make an impact, um, to spend our time and our budgets in the smartest ways possible and the most impactful ways possible. And perhaps most importantly, to set ourselves up for next year. 2024 is a brand new year. And for the folks on this panel, a big part of planning for that involves media mix and looking at what channels and tactics to leverage to meet their business goals. And I mean, meet their real business goals, right? Not clicks, not likes, but real business results. And increasingly, connected television is really emerging as a performance channel and not just an awareness one, um, like it's more traditional television predecessor. So we're gonna dig into that today. And hopefully everyone who has so generously taken the time to pop in and spend time with us comes away with new insights, new perspective, new learnings from this group that you can take into your own business and your own way of thinking. So with that, Let's jump right in. I thought a good place to start would be to go around to each of our amazing panelists here and ask the question, how do you think about CTV overall as part of your marketing plan? 
Um, and just to kind of kick things off, Kelly, I'm going to put you on the spot to get us rolling and then we'll go around. Sounds good. Um, I think overall, you know, Connected TV for us was a fairly easy decision to kind of jump into. Um, as you watch the adoption numbers of cord cutters um, grow, we knew this was something we wanted to add to our marketing plan. Um, I would say we are still kind of walking before we run. We're, you know, still treading and learning the space a little bit. But um, over the past few years, you know, we've really been able to target and test different audiences before rolling um, maybe goes out to different channels. So we've been able to test, um, you know, dual language and things like that and kind of watch the awareness grow on that demographic. Um, and with that, maybe roll it out to other marketing channels. So it really has kind of benefited and allowed us to kind of take what we're doing in Connected TV and bring it out to maybe some of our other channels. Amazing, thank you. Who wants to go next? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab. I come like maybe from a different point of view on this, right? You know, we're an emerging brand. So, so for us, uh, at our current moment, like the thought of TV has always been like, well, it's, it's big box, it's too broad, it's, it's, it's hard to measure, and it might be out of reach for us. Um, with that said, uh, Connected TV kind of brings that closer to something that we can do, right? It's, it's more targeted, it's more immediate, we can really go to that, that, that trade area if we wanted to, uh, a lot more measurable, and then, you know, kind of like, the right size for something that we can do. We can be really conservative about kind of like what's the budget, what's the scope, uh, and what's the intent that we want to target with it. So uh, maybe maybe some of the uh, scary things in the past, such as how do we measure, how do we afford it, uh, are things that are now kind of like more at reach to a smaller brands trying to to kind of broaden the awareness and, and kind of jump on 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 TV. Um, uh, with the right strategy, uh, um, so 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 it's an exciting time for us. You, you, just knowing that we have these tools available for for uh, for brands that maybe don't have the reach or the budgets of the big brands. Yeah, I love that. I love right. the idea that it's for emerging brands or smaller brands. You can be on television. You know, that's a big moment for a brand, and so for it to be an accessible way to do that, I, I think that's a really interesting concept. Sorry, Stefan, what were you going to say? No, I was literally going to say, no, that's perfect. That, that's exactly what I was going to say. We see, we work with a lot of emerging and challenger brands and it's an opportunity for them to be a part of the more prestige placements in the media mix. Um, and I think that that can help not only with the performance and the direct response type of campaigns, but it gives them a, a branded opportunity. There is definitely a prestige in the mind of a viewer versus seeing an ad on say digital that I think creates some level of brand permanency and and yeah and prestige that challenger brands can now have that they maybe haven't been able to in the past. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Stephanie? And, you know, I don't think CTV can be ignored. You know, whether you're w working on a video team or a digital team, it has its place across both. You know, from the video perspective, a lot of the teams are using it more as an awareness or a mass reach vehicle, also something that complements their linear buys. Um, but if a digital team is considering uh, CTV, you can get a little bit more down funnel and you can also pick your partner based on, you know, whatever your overarching strategy is um, with the innovation and, and targeting that has, you know, continued to increase in CTV, you know, video teams and digital teams can, you know, get a little bit further down funnel versus years past. Yeah, makes sense. So if I hear what you're saying, it's like a good mix of that, the brand permanence to use Stefan's um, terminology along with the targetability of digital. It's kind of the best of both worlds. And I love that you said it can't be ignored. Don't ignore it. Hear that everyone, Stephanie said. Um, great, well, thank you all for that. I think it's really good table setting. Um, so I guess where I wanna go next is, um, you know, the beauty of CTV really is that we can get much more targeted and much more efficient. So with that, since you all have kind of adopted this new medium and you've played with it and tested and learned, have you have you been surprised by any of the, the insights that you've gotten from running these campaigns? And if so, how has that 
kind of shown up in your overall strategy? I'll go. Um, one of the things that has been surprising to us, it, we've always sort of flirted with linear um, and, and broadcast TV um, just sort of as an ancillary, you know, piece of the media mix. And when we delved into connected TV, we found that it's this beautiful marriage of this sort of digital, the, the capabilities of digital targeting and reporting but still having a lot of the benefits and uh, of, of linear. And I think one of the things that has been really surprising to us are a lot of the retargeting capabilities on the platform. Uh, that's a complete novelty as far as we're concerned as it pertains to uh, television and the ability to use that to get, as to, to echo what Stephanie was saying, to get downstream and to get down funnel uh, that's been a really surprising kind of update and something that we've seen a lot of success with. Um, I can jump in too. So as I mentioned earlier, we do have the dual language um, test that we kind of ran and saw, um, you know, some really great return and how it resonated really well with that um, demographic. We've also been able to kind of um, target ads specifically. So we've had a commercial in the past with a sports um, star and on one channel where we're running connected TV, you're able to really exactly drill down to, he was part of the MLB. So the MLB, whether you maybe bought MLB or you watch MLB, whatever it might be, and kind of just target that audience to see, you know, a really great return on that spot. It probably resonates perfectly with that audience. It's, you know, going to drive more attention for them than it would maybe just your regular viewer. Um, and again, like Stefan just said, the retargeting as well has been um, a really great addition with the Connected TV. Perfect. Yeah, that feels like a really smart way to use those dollars that can help you tie it back to the rest of your strategy. I feel like we all come up against everything being so disparate, all these different channels and trying to figure out how they can work together. Um, I love that just as a tactical example of something that everyone can can try is to test and learn in those more granular places and then apply that back. So thank you for sharing. Love a specific example um, with the MLB is really interesting. I bet a lot of people are aware of that campaign. And if not, you can go Google it right now. Um, great. Well, we talked a little bit about funnel. I think maybe Stephanie, you um, you alluded to this. And I wanted to hear a bit about, you know, how you all think about CTV when it comes to matching it with objectives. Is it up funnel for you? Is it down funnel? Is it a mix? What kinds of objectives um, are you looking to solve when you do leverage CTV? I can kind of jump in from kind of, you know, the marketplace perspective. Um, CTV is growing. It is a vast marketplace and it is becoming a little bit cluttered. Um, but you need to kind of understand what your strategy is first to understand who you would like to partner with. Do you want to go publisher direct, do something a little bit more custom? Are you looking for platforms like the OEMs for more of a measurement retargeting um, strategy? Um, are you looking for someone that has foot traffic capabilities of uh, tracking back attribution? So you really need to understand what you're looking for to kind of wade through this marketplace as it continues to grow, as you know, Amazon just announced that they're adding ads to their prime. Um, so it's every single day there is something new. So it's really important to understand who you're partnering with, what their capabilities are and how it makes sense for your, for your brand. Absolutely, there's a lot of options, aren't there? Lots. <laughs> it's a full-time job navigating this space sometimes. Anyone else want to talk through how you view it in your mix or where, where it fits in the funnel, what goals you, you're trying to achieve when you buy CTV? Um, I could jump in again. Um, for us, it's currently still an awareness play for us. Um, you know, we are still every year kind of upping that budget just a little bit. Um, we're working with our company that manages most of our connected TV um, just to look at, um, make sure we're not overlapping with our linear too much. Um, look at the frequency. So it's still very much in the early stages for us with awareness being that, that top priority right now. 
Yeah, I agree with that. Like for us, it will be a, a, an awareness play. I, I, you know, I think that these days for marketers, uh, we're in a better place where we can measure a lot of things, but we also became really obsessed with measuring and then factor everything in a ROAS conversation because it's obviously what the stakeholders want to do and what the senior leadership wants to see and you know, facilitate some of those conversations. So for sure, there is there is a lot more measurable things with Connect TV. Uh, however, I will say uh, top of the funnel, you know, to me is you know we we are more obsessed of meeting the customers where they are right and the reality is even if there is a button at the end of your spot in connected tv or there is you know if there is an action for consumers to take i always tend to think that real people maybe marketers maybe we do that because we want to engage with everything but real people don't watch and then go right away and then place the order right away right people might place the order the next day that's the way you know the reason why we have attribution windows on all of this stuff so like you know, we tend to think that if we're running an awareness play, we should, you know, obviously talk to customers and we should feel it at the at the register uh, versus trying to, you know, uh, obsess with this whole crazy attribution model, right? So for us as an emerging brand, introducing our brand to new markets is more like how many eyeballs can we put on this to make sure that they understand what NAFNAF is, what we serve, how, uh, uh, how to interact with us. And that's kind of like the way we'll, we'll will approach kind of our strategy for CTV. Can I can I say one thing too? Just on the flip side of that, oftentimes I think when challenger brands and like emerging brands hear awareness, it kind of scares them away because they're not in a position where they can justify marketing dollars to go towards awareness. And I think that it's rare that I've seen connected TV be used uh, excluding awareness or in, in replacement of awareness, but we still see a lot of down funnel conversion results and we're seeing really impressive ROI, uh, when it comes to actual purchases or in-store visits. Um, so I wouldn't ever want somebody who's like a challenger brand, who's still very, very cost conscious to be afraid of that awareness because it translates to sales in really impressive ways. And, sometimes very surprising ways as well. So uh, I agree that awareness has to kind of be a piece of what you're coming to accomplish with Connected TV, but I wouldn't be scared away by that alone. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think it's really interesting kind of the, the different perspectives. I mean, I think I wish more marketers thought like both of you, Nico and Stefan, where it's, it's taking a step back and saying, Let's not just focus on that last touch attribution where someone clicked an ad and ordered lunch, right? Let's look at like kind of the macro and the halo effects and the real business results. Again, of what actually matters of, you know, those orders coming in, the cash register ringing, um, foot traffic, sales lift, all of those things. So super, super helpful. I mean, what I'm hearing is it fits in a lot of places in the funnel based on what you're trying to accomplish as a business. Um, and the nice thing is there is an awareness capability and there are performance capabilities. So it's really, really versatile in that way. Would you all agree with that? Yep, yeah, nodding heads. Absolutely. Awesome. We're agreeing on everything. I thought there'd be more healthy debate, but I love it. Um, okay, cool. So I want to kind of double click to use an industry term I hear everyone say these days. Let's double click into the idea of CTV versus linear. Uh, and I think Stephanie, when we spoke, you had some thoughts on this because I think you're in this world of linear, but I wanna hear from everyone how, how buying CTV is different than buying linear and specifically as one tries to look like the other, right? CTV world is trying to get into the upfront ecosystem and the linear world is, trying to be more flexible like digital is. So how do you see kind of the tensions there? Do you want it to go in one direction or another as a buyer and as a marketer, you know, where does that go that makes it most helpful to you? So coming out of this year's upfront, we did see um, a few of our CTV partners kind of act more like a traditional linear upfront deal. 
Um, we saw a little bit less flexibility that we've seen in the past. And I totally understand, you know, where they're coming from. They want to see, you know, their yield management wants to see what they could possibly see in the upcoming year, rather than just working off of endeavors and not so much commitments. You know, we are seeing that share shift between linear and CTV just based on the consumption and how people are viewing and how many opportunities there are and apps there are. So we are seeing a shift of some of the more CTV partners pushing themselves into the upfront marketplace while we are trying, you know, the linear, the, the more linear broadcast upfront partners, some of their digital properties, they are trying a little bit to act like a digital first property. So it's 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 an interesting dynamic that we saw this past upfront of where where is this all heading and what what will this look like next year? Yep. Anyone else have thoughts on that dynamic? I mean, I think I think for us, flexibility is king again for an emerging brand trying to 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 kind of like dip you know your toes in the water. Uh, the thought of upfronts and long term commitments is crazy, uh, and I think uh, maybe what Stephanie is saying will end up in in, in the industry realizing kind of how to maybe figure out the best of both worlds where they can have and secure some of the revenues and some of the efficiencies that they're looking to uh, uh, to fulfill with the upfronts by also understanding that in a world where marketers we want to test and learn and we want to make sure that we understand what this is doing for my business before I, you know, I want to date you before I marry you, right? Uh, I, I I think that, that, um, that that's what's scary for like you know uh, a smaller brands trying to jump in the space is like oh hold on now I need to commit half of the year a full year in advance can we can we figure out a way that we can that we can try it right before before you buy it uh, um, and that's that's kind of like my perspective will be I think many marketers out there were looking to demo we're looking to pilot we're looking to get you know what I would call investable evidence that then makes it really easy to have a conversation with your CFO or with your CEO about this is what I want to do right so like my point there would be uh it's hard I think I think that there is intro level type of stuff that maybe is not focused on efficiency but allows you to to test but I think the more the more we get the opportunity to 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 experiment, the better it is. I think I think for us. I think the other to to piggyback on that, we see there's sort of some gatekeeping. It feels like around a lot of the linear uh, media, and and I don't mean that in a negative way per se, because it's obviously there's a, a lot more history there. Um, but for brands that uh, that we work with. Uh, I mean, a lot of them are coming into this and like Nico was saying, they're dipping their toe into it. Maybe they're spending $20,000 and it's a relatively small media buy. But I think that they care about two things. One, am I going to see results quickly from it? Because that $20,000 has to come out on the other end. Um, and then two, I think that they're, it's, it's well, it's exactly what you said, Nico, is just are they able to see results in a way that then justifies the increasing investment in the platform? And so um, I, we did a, a campaign with a company in Florida called Buff City Soaps, and it really was, it was a small media buy, but, and it was all in-store traffic focused and they had the awareness, but it also was like real results. They had a 7% lift in their store traffic in that geo and that's, at least to a lot of small to mid-market brands, I think that those are the types of things that make their ears perk up. And that's certainly what attracted us to a, uh, to connect with TV in the first place. Yeah, I mean, those are uh, exciting lift numbers for sure. Go ahead, Kelly. Sorry, um, I was just gonna say, I would definitely agree with everybody. Um, you know, I think publishers are becoming maybe a little bit more rigid um, with their buys and trying to mirror that linear upfront process. I would say one thing, um, we do buy direct from a few people but then we have a company that manages our majority of our connected TV buy, um, which does allow you then to kind of move your dollars from maybe one publisher or channel that you're not seeing perform great. Um, so you're kind of not stuck with that one for the, you know, your whole buy if, if you're not seeing it perform. So you do have the ability then to kind of move that around and, and see what works best for your brand. 
Yeah, absolutely. And to keep optimizing, right? We should never be done leaning into what's working and pivoting. Um, in case anyone didn't catch it, Nico says upfronts are like marriage. So we have an analogy we can all hang on to forever. <laughs> um, super helpful. I think that's, it's, it'll be interesting to see, you know, I think CTV, we, we want to act like linear because that's how that's operated for so long. But I think it's a balance of not losing the benefit of the flexibility of digital, right? So I think that's really interesting. So we've said a lot of great things about connected television and how it fits and, and the pros. I would love to hear from each of you, if there were a challenge about this medium, if there was something that we could make better that would make it even more of a no-brainer no -brainer for you or something that we could evolve about it, as you know, the technologists of the industry, it's our jobs to continue to bring you products that are better and better. If there's something missing in it or a challenge that you do see, um, I think our, our audience would love to learn that piece from you too so that we can innovate. Uh, I'll go. I think, you know, uh, for us, one of the challenging things is, you know, I always try to talk to, you know, to to friends and peers about this, which is chase the customer, don't chase the trend. So like, you know, any evidence that we can see that this is, the, you, oh, you, you got to do it because it's popular, right? Well, you don't, right? You know, uh, uh, for for uh, for a brand like us, we need to 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 pick and choose really, really, you know, in a surgical way, what do we do and what do we put our money against? Uh, some of that is understanding more of the space is really useful. I think, you know, I don't want to get the lost, like, you know, Stefan was bringing a point and you guys will talk about um, the retargeting capabilities and think more digitally about this medium that just linear TV. Well, that forces you to really dig deep and understand where this fits in the customer journey and kind of what's that state of mind and that intent that you're trying to approach almost on a micro level, right? Where will people see this? What's the frequency? Where, you know, do they see this before social after, you know, because we're all putting money in different platforms, but where is this fit is really important. And uh, it can be a lonely place for marketers to try to figure all of this out, right? So like, I think the more, the more, uh, in the industry, there is more resources to try to understand, not just, hey, this is how much money you need in this mix, and then, how, you know, forecast how much you're going to get back, more, more about in your broader strategy, this is what you've been doing, this is the role of CTV as part of that, and this is what we think it, it, it can do to plus up what you're already doing. That's, I think, where, you know, I'm curious about what Kelly will say, because they came from obviously a tradition of like linear TV and stuff like that. And they were like, well, this needs to fit within all of the 4,400 4, channels that we're already using. What's the role of this? How do we measure success? How do you deduplicate to make sure that this is very clear that this is working versus what, it, you know, what else we're doing? So, so, so the help from industry experts for us to try to understand really the role of it and then how do we measure success and, and, and how it fits within the strategy is something that I, that I think many of us are craving. Yeah, no pressure, Kelly. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, I would say, um, looking at linear and connected TV for us, um, you know, we do have a reporting dashboard that really allows us to, to take a look at that overlap. Are there channels that, you know, maybe we don't need to do connected TV on them because we are hitting them so hard with linear. Um, I would say maybe that kind of ties into one of the... Um, pain points um, that I was going to bring up was just the reporting aspect. So from some buys that we have, um, you know, we're getting that foot traffic or the website conversions that are direct, directly attributed to our connected TV buys and then other publishers or direct buys and things like that, we're not getting it. So you're kind of getting this like siloed reporting and trying to, trying to make sense of it all and make sure we're using it to our, our best advantage um, would be what I would think would be biggest pain point from my end. One other, one thing to look out for if you're buying across many different CTV partners is managing frequency at the household level. So if you are buying Publisher Direct in a handful of different places, you're working with a couple of, you know, aggregates, how are you serving that up to households? You know, there's, there's households that are very heavy viewers versus, you know, light viewers. 
most likely you're if you're not managing your frequency, you're hitting that same household over and over again. And over here at Horizon, we have our own strategy called OTTFM, where we take a portion of our managed service buys and switch them over to PG or PMP to get either a watch or optimize based on how many times we're hitting individual households across campaigns. So we're making sure that we're not oversaturating households and we are you know, garnering some of that incremental reach with the additional controls that programmatic allows us to do. So it's really important to understand how you're hitting the households, how many times, and how many partners you're working with because your, your campaign could be working against you because you're just serving the same household over and over again. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think we've all had the experience where we're watching something and we see like the same insurance ad over and over. So um, I think that really hits home and, and it's really interesting to hear how you're you're managing to tackle that at Horizon too. Really great. So thank you. Stefan? I was just going to say, she makes a, definitely makes a really good point because I think we sometimes get so focused on the placement that we forget that there's a viewer on the other end of that placement. And we need to be thinking about their interaction with what we're giving them. And so I don't know that I necessarily see like a con with the placements of connected TV, but I would say that I see a con in how people use it and, and more on the, especially on the creative side. Like I think there's, uh, I think that there's a, a literal distance between somebody who is being exposed to an ad and where they purchase. And obviously like digital is like immediate, like it's like the distance between your thumb and a button and connected TV, that distance is a little bit bigger. And our job is like really good marketers should be shrinking that space so that it becomes as streamlined as and as easy as possible to get that viewer to have some sort of behavior that we're trying to drive. And I think too often we just think of the platform and we're like, oh, well, I, I can use connected TV now. That's great. It's a new shiny thing. And we forget that there's a viewer who's experiencing it on the other end and making sure that you're giving them a a very unique and memorable experience is oftentimes overlooked by people. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Um, I do want to make sure we leave time for questions. I think we have quite a few people in attendance, but um, thank you all so much for this discussion. I think it was really just such a, such a diverse group of perspectives and opinions to kind of, kind of recap it. You know, Nico's thinking about thinking about CTV as, um, increasing scale and emer for emerging markets and newer brands and scaling up and reach and, and awareness. Stefan's using it for foot traffic and as a performance tool, among other things. I'm oversimplifying, but you know, Kelly and Jersey Mike's are using it to test and learn and then apply those learnings in other places. And then for Stephanie at Horizon, it's about finding finding its place in the mix in in big big campaigns for big brands and finding finding the right balance of the media mix. So I think what we learned and heard today is there's there's quite a, a lot of different ways to think about it and leverage it. I so appreciate all of your perspectives. I think we all learned a lot today. Um, so thank you for spending this time. And I think we will we'll toss it back to Danielle, who is going to manage the Q&A. Awesome. Thank you all so much for those insights. So much to talk about. And as Rosie previewed, we have quite a few questions already from our audience today. Thank you to our audience for sending in those questions. Feel free if you have any others, uh, put them in the Q&A box right beneath the video window on your screen. A couple of quick reminders from Adweek before we get started with that. Today's webinar has been recorded and will be available later today. We'll email that recording link out to everyone, so keep an eye out for that. And if you would like a copy of today's slides, it's a very brief deck, obviously, but if you would like that as a takeaway, feel free to grab those from the event resources area on your screen. Uh, to our audience members, please know that if we do not get to your question today, our time for that is limited. We always make sure that they get forwarded over to our sponsor so they have the opportunity to possibly reply offline. Now, let's jump into some of these questions here. Our first question relates to foot traffic. So I know several people were mentioning that throughout the panel. Um, someone would just love to know, you know, just have a clear explanation of how foot traffic attribution works in the land of CTV. Rosie, you want to jump in there? Stephanie, curious if, if either of you have thoughts on that. Stephanie, you want it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm to jump in. You know what? I'll throw it to someone that actually might have results or, you know, real life experience rather than, you know, marketplace. 
Yeah, I can kind of, I can talk through, it sounds like a technology question, so I'll keep it brief and not too nerdy. And then if anyone wants to jump in on sort of like applicability, please feel free. Um, so, so essentially how foot traffic works in the land of CTV is we're really lucky in this medium because connected television is connected to the household. Um, the devices themselves or the televisions themselves are connected to the household. And so are all the mobile devices in your home, right? So we're able to see this television device that was served a Jersey Mike's ad um, also is part of a household where these three smartphones are logged into the same Wi-Fi. And then we can see that the day after you saw a Jersey Mike's ad while you were watching Real Housewives, um, you went and got a sandwich for lunch that next day. We can see that your phone crossed the threshold into that Jersey Mike store and tie it back to the household where you were served a CTV ad. So it makes it really cool in the TV space, kind of jumping off of what a lot of these guys said about how TV is such an impactful screen and, and channel, um, but that piece makes it more powerful in the way that they, we can then measure what happens next and a result that came from that CTV ad. So hopefully that answers the question. Does anyone else want to jump in and, and tag on to that? Perfect. Awesome. I thought that was super clear. Thank you for that, Rosie. Our next question here deals with what I think is um, potentially a misperception about CTV buying, but you guys are the experts, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Um, someone says, big barrier to entry when it comes to TV is production cost. How do emerging brands limit that cost? Any thoughts on that? Don't believe their lies. It doesn't cost as much <laughs> as you think. Um, there is a, a tradition with spending a lot of money on productions. And part of that is tied to the prestige component. You don't want to put a piece of content out there that makes you look cheap when you're going to be getting millions of impressions on it. So there is an element of investment that is justified. Uh, but we've seen really impressive results with really scrappy content. And it doesn't need to be expensive per se. It can definitely enhance the ability to build brand awareness and to have that kind of positive impact. But uh, yeah, don't you don't have to listen to that rhetoric that it feels like you have to spend a lot. We've seen really successful UGC content run on connected TV and uh, and it and it can perform great. So so don't be afraid of it. Yeah, I, I I I like to add to that. I think creativity, you know, is at the center of this. And I think, you know, assuming that it's only for exp expensive production will be just to say that creativity only happens when you have, you know, two million dollars, right? And the reality is creativity should happen when you have this bootstrap set of conditions that force you to be creative, right? So, you know, UGC is one way to do it. The other way is organize your shoots. If you're already a location to capture a photo shoot or whatever, tag alone some other guys that are gonna tag, you know, uh, attack video. Many of us already have either teams or resources or, you know, fractional resources creating content for social media. Well, make sure that you're capturing that content on both vertical and, and, uh, and in uh, traditional landscape format so you can use some of that stuff. There is, there is many different ways to go about it. And also the length of that stuff. Don't feel like you are forced to run a 30 second ad uh, uh, because there is also flexibility kind of on the length of some of those things. So, so I think just, just, you, just get with your creative team, whether it's in-house or whether you have external partners and figure out how can you optimize that trip that your creatives are already doing to capture something else, uh, to capture what you need to fulfill that, like that media buy. Such a great point. Thank you both. Uh, yeah, creativity really is key, I think, in that uh, example. We have another question here. It's pretty multi-part, so I'm just going to read it out. <laughs> and uh, it relates to a point that Stefan made earlier, but anyone, please feel free to jump in. Uh, so someone says, to Stefan's point about awareness in conjunction with down funnel results, for teams that who do not have robust attribution uh, tracking, I would imagine that would be a tougher thing to deploy as you wouldn't be able to truly show those results the way you would uh, like to. So for teams in that spot, would you be more cautious? Again, multi-part question, but attribution's role here. Any thoughts on that when it comes to you know driving down funnel results? I, I'll just speak briefly. I know I'm talking a lot, but uh, 
first of all, you should be able to get uh, help and support in building some strong attribution models. Um, and attribution is never perfect. It's like every marketer since the history of time, I think, has been maybe unduly wary of attribution and they and they maybe think about it a little bit too much. But I don't know that I would encourage cautiousness. Uh, I think that you should certainly measure what you can and, and get the results. But at the end of the day is what I think I'm echoing what everybody here at some point has said, there's real results on the back end. And so really where you should be seeing it is in your top and bottom lines. Like if you're not seeing it there, then uh, you can certainly run connected TV with that not being your end goal. But I think even as a halo effect, you should see it. So uh, I'd be, I would not encourage cautiousness when it comes to attribution, maybe a level of just the same kind of, skepticism that marketers have always had around attribution, but I, I don't know that I would encourage cautiousness. Yeah, I want to add quickly, I, I love that answer. I think that, you know, working with partners like Ground Truth that provide measurement, you should absolutely get that where you can. And you should absolutely work with partners that have thoughtful methodologies on measurement and attribution and ones that aren't in, just most interested in showing you pretty numbers, but ones that really you feel like are defensible and understandable, but to Stefan's point, it needs to match back to what you're seeing in your business. Um, and it, you know, you, you as the marketer, as the business owner, as the brand are going to have the best gut check on if that correlation is really matching. Um, so partner with your vendors, but certainly having a good handle on what your own KPIs internally are is the best way to make sure that that lines up. Can I, can I throw maybe a little bit of a different point of view there? I, you know, I think like for, by the way, I agree with what both of you said, but like, you know, I kind of like the different thing is maybe not every person in this, uh, in this room has the budget to have a media agency or a buying partner or stuff like that. Maybe they're doing internally, maybe they're a solo player as part of just an organization, right? So, so let's dismitify attribution a little bit because attribution is whatever helps you show a result in front of your leadership or the rest of your team. However, you want to define that. Yes, there is benchmarks and industry benchmarks and we want to compare with other people, but at the core of it is what helps me measure success, right? Is there any way to attribute what I'm doing in marketing to that success? So if you're a smaller brand and what you're doing is you're asking every customer that walks through your doors, hey, did you see us on you know, whatever partner on YouTube or on Hulu, and they're just, you know, kind of marking a card, yes or no, or whatever. And that's your most basic old school way of attributing that, just like when you do flyers and people have to bring them to the store. That's okay, you know, as long as you can count, down, count those, multiply by whatever people are spending your business, and then get to a number of like, we feel that we invested X many dollars and we got this many dollars back. That's still a good way to do it. So sometimes we get scared because of the technology component of it or the attacking component of it. I agree. Many of the of the partners themselves or many of the companies like uh, like the ones represented in, in, in this webinar have the tools to facilitate that for you because that's the way that they run their business. They will tag you and help you walk your way into attribution. But even if you're part of a smaller organization, just figure out what is important for you to tell that story and then figure out a way to measure it. Well said. Thank you all very much for those perspectives. Appreciate that. Um, our next question here, going back to earlier in the event when Kelly talked very briefly about the dual language test um, that she conducted, I think that's a really fun example of, um, you know, the potential for testing that's available with CTV. So someone's curious, how many language did you, languages did you test with that? Uh, did you find some languages responded better than others to CTV? Any other uh, insights you might want to share there, Kelly? Yeah, so it was just a one language. We did bilingual um, was what we were looking to see. We have a lot of stores and some areas that could benefit um, from some of that additional marketing. Um, so from what we've seen from the awareness in that demographic, though, um, we have seen good results so far, but it was just a one language. Got it. Thanks for adding some additional context there. Let's switch gears slightly here and talk a little bit about retargeting. So um, again, another multi-part question. I'll just read it out and then anyone can feel free to jump in. When you all talk retargeting, do you use CTV to retarget for additional frequency with an already reached audience? 
or do you use other tactics like targeted display uh, to follow up after an initial CTV reach? My guess is both. Uh, so curious to hear your thoughts on that. Um, we've done it both ways here. We've done it um, based on a specific program maybe that we were you know, a part of, maybe it's a sporting event or something like that, and kind of retargeting those people with a connected TV ad that maybe wouldn't have normally fit into our, our targeted group. Um, we've also done it with some grand openings for our stores where they might run local connected TV and then retarget with some um, banners. So. And also retargeting can be used in the sense of incremental reach. So you might want to suppress those households that have already seen your ad to make sure that, you know, other households are seeing your ad to get the message across. So it really honestly depends how you're looking at retargeting, whether you're retargeting on the CTV screen or retargeting on other devices that are associated with that IP address. So it really honestly depends what you're trying to do with retargeting. Got it. Thanks for those thoughts. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for questions today. I'd like to thank our speakers, Nico, Stephanie, Kelly, Stefan, and Rosie, as well as our sponsor, Ground Truth. Some final reminders here from Adweek. Make sure you grab those slides from the event resources area, and be sure to check your email for a link to the on-demand recording, which will be available later today. As always, if you enjoyed today's webinar, be sure to check out the At Week webinars calendar link below to learn more about our upcoming events. Again, huge, huge thank you to our speakers uh, for being here today and for letting us pick your brains during this Q&A session. Thank you to your audience for making the time to join us. And as always, we look forward to seeing everyone at an upcoming At Week webinar. Thanks, everyone.